Well, howdy. Welcome back to Mr. Fulcher's economics class, live from Mr. Fulcher's house. I uh, have to make this one a little quick because my phone battery is on the fritz, but I wanted to get this filmed tonight. So, uh, we'll talk a little bit today about the concept of regulation and deregulation. Hey, middle schoolers in the hallway, shut up. Sorry, I was trying to like reproduce like a real virtual reality experience for you to make you really feel like you were back at school. So anyway, I uh, figured I'd throw that in there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. So uh, what is regulation? What is deregulation? So regulation basically refers to laws passed by the government that limit what businesses can and cannot do. Uh, and the primary... Uh, purpose uh, probably the most important field of regulation is what they call antitrust regulation, which is where they try to prevent monopolies and encourage competition in the marketplace. Um, and antitrust legislation was largely made in response to the establishment of the trust, which was uh, a, a you know legal idea that really develops in the 1800s. The first major trust uh, is the Standard Oil Company of John D. Rockefeller. And Standard Oil winds up uh, at one point um, controlling 90% of the oil market in the United States. And they had enough capital on hand at that point that anytime someone started a new oil company that could potentially provide any kind of competition, they would come, you know, make them a godfather offer, you know, one that they can't, hey, one you can't refuse, you know. And uh, that, was a, that was a really, really bad Italian accent. I'm sorry. Um, so it's more like... Make you an offer you can't refuse. I don't know. I'm trying. Uh, so Rockefeller, though, they would just buy out everybody. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, people really started to think that this was, this was unfair. There were several other people, um, like Carnegie with U.S. Steel uh, and, and some other, other you know, trusts that were, that were controversial at the time. Uh, ultimately, uh, and some of some of what they would do, they would buy these companies. And one thing they would use, you Brooke didn't really talk about this, but one strategy they would use was the idea of the interlocking directorate, where they would have the same board of directors, kind of managing multiple companies. They're supposed to be the competition for each other, but obviously they 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 weren't. And um, so a trust is basically a group of firms combined in order to reduce competition. It's very similar in concept. We talked in the previous lesson about the cartel, right? The most famous example of a cartel in the modern world is OPEC, uh, the oil and petroleum, the uh, oil and petroleum exporting countries. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the, the nations of OPEC conspire to kind of keep the price of, of oil artificially high. So, um, and uh, another key word here you should want to know is the term merger, which means when two companies co combine their assets and become one company. A lot of times if one company is going out of business, but maybe they've got some sort of patent or something that the other company feels like they could uh, help, uh, a lot of times they'll try to buy them out or merge with them. Or sometimes you've got two companies that uh, are, are competing and maybe they're both struggling and they try to come together, pool their assets together. And mergers are a very important tool in business development, but they also uh, can be catastrophic for competition. You know, if Ford and General Motors, for instance, were to try to merge, uh, there would be functionally no competition in the American auto industry. So that would probably not be allowed by antitrust legislation. So antitrust legislation uh, is laws that are created for the purpose of preventing those sorts of monopolies like Rockefeller and people of his ilk had uh, gotten towards the late 1800s. Um, and the first major antitrust act was the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, of 1890. There's another one called the Clayton Antitrust Act that comes a little bit later. Um, there's a handful of other ones. Um, and a lot of, today, a lot of the antitrust enforcement is carried out by uh, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. Uh, you know, if you have two companies that want to merge, you actually have to get approval uh, from the government if, if the asset, it might be if the assets are beyond a certain level, or it may just be, I'm not sure all the, I'm not a corporate lawyer by any means. Uh, I was just a lowly history teacher. But... Uh, I do know that you do have to like get approval for, for mergers of large companies because they've got to look at competition. Uh, they've got to look at market share. They typically don't want to approve a merger that's going to 
uh, leave just a couple of firms in control of, uh, of a whole market sector. So, um, uh, so what are some of the things that are banned by antitrust competition uh, legislation? So one thing that is illegal is what they call price fixing. So it's not legal for competitors to get together and agree not to go below a certain amount. Now, if you notice when we talked about OPEC in class the other week, that's exactly what OPEC does. But of course, they're not under American antitrust law. But uh, so right, so they agree no one's going to sell below you know you know dollar eighty five a barrel or whatever whatever the market rate is or um, or uh, not like a it would actually be a lot more than that a barrel. I got barrel and gallon confused in my head for a second. But, uh, but anyway, they're going to set like a price uh, at which you can't, uh, you know, at which no one's going to sell below. Well, you're not allowed to do that. Um, you know, you, you can't get together and say we're not going to sell for less unless you're going to risk uh, potentially uh, being looked at for antitrust violation. Another thing... Uh, is the idea of market allocation, which is then the idea of companies trying to divide the market between them so they have geographic monopolies. So um, uh, market allocation actually um, is a major part of the whole concept of how gang war works, right? This is my quarter, that's your quarter. You know, you're never the twain shall meet. And if you try, there's, there's shots fired, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, but of course, obviously, all that's happening in illegal markets, right? So, in, in legal markets, uh, you don't have, um, you can't say, uh, you know, uh, IBM on the west side and Apple on the east side, and between the two of us, we've we've got the monopoly on everything, uh, and we can't cross each other's lines because then when you do that, you're doing away with competition altogether, um, you know, for, for each individual purchaser. So, uh, that's not going to be allowed. There's, there's, uh, you can't coordinate to kind of take over the world together, uh, you know, as, as a couple of firms working as a group. Uh, one thing that's a little bit harder to discern is predatory pricing, which is, so predatory pricing is when a uh, company tries to uh, drive prices so low that it drives all their competitors out of business, and then they raise up rates dramatically on everybody once the competition's gone. Um, Amazon, I think, has faced some accusations of predatory pricing. Uh, I'm not enough of an expert to know. I do know I like Amazon, though. Uh, it made my life a whole lot easier, as you can see. Um, so, uh, so uh, predatory pricing is like uh, you come in, you undercut everybody, you've got like some stronger financial backing in your investment than they do. So the idea is when they go out of business, I'm going to have the whole region to myself and, you know, uh, everyone's going to be paying me because I've you know, bankrupted everyone else. That's not, uh, that's not considered kosher. Uh, but of course the problem is how do you dif differentiate predatory pricing and competitive pricing? Because everyone's trying to lower prices, uh, to increase market share. And that's the nature of competition, right? So this, this became very controversial in the late nineties, uh, when Microsoft actually was taken before, um, the, the federal trade commission and were sued, uh, under antitrust, antitrust violations, um, you know, nearly lost the company, nearly got split up. Um, and a lot of it was because they had started giving away Microsoft Internet Explorer with Windows. When you would buy a, uh, a Windows computer, it came with Internet Explorer. And so other Internet browsers and stuff at this time were saying, this is unfair because you're, they're charging zero. We can't compete with that. Now, of course, if you're a consumer, you're thinking, you know, this giving away Internet Explorer for free really is working out well for us. So, you know, that was a very controversial antitrust case. I don't even remember... Uh, if they had, if they settled out of court or what they agreed to do to get out of that, they may have been acquitted. I, I can't remember the details, but I, I know that was a big, uh, a big to do. Um, so what are some ways that, uh, they enforce this? One thing is the government can issue what they call a cease and desist order where they see if a certain regulation is being broken, they can issue this order telling them they have to stop that certain practice. And from that point, refusal can lead to things like being prosecuted, uh, potentially being broken up. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll break up a monopoly. Um, you know, uh, AT&T uh, used to, they call, used to call it Ma Bell, um, used to have a 
complete monopoly on the telephone poles of America. Uh, and so, you know, it was one telephone service nationwide, basically. They broke that up uh, under antitrust law. So cease and desist is one thing they can do. Uh, also, uh, companies are required to make certain public disclosures about their products, uh, about their effectiveness. Um, you know, there's, there's certain information that has to be uh, divulged publicly uh, for the sake of protecting consumers. Um, some organizations that are involved in consumer protection and regulation, you know, so obviously some of these, um, they're, you know, at the times can be criticized for overreaching their boundaries, at least at certain times, but um, some are good to have. But, uh, so you've got the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA, uh, who uh, you know, they uh, are responsible for um, making sure that the food and drugs are safe. Uh, and that involves extensive testing of drugs before they're allowed to be brought to market. Sometimes, uh, right now, there's some controversy as it re relates to the coronavirus treatment that maybe the FDA is slowing some treatments down that uh, we'd like to get fast. But on the other hand, the, the counter argument is if you just let people just flood the market with anything and you wind up with a bunch of people dead over it, you know, that's not a good situation either. So um, the Federal Trade Commission enforces antitrust law. The Federal Communication Commission, or FCC, they manage, you know, there's only so much radio spectrum in the atmosphere, and so it has to be managed to a certain degree, so they manage to make sure, like, to where radio stations don't bleed all over each other. Um, they manage, you know, there's some attempt, there's been some arguments for them taking over regulation of internet bandwidth and stuff like that. Um, there's been uh, some controversy con concerning, concerning that and concerning whether the FCC should take a more active role in regulating the internet. Perhaps you remember people fighting about something called net neutrality a year or two ago. Um, you know, typically I think it should be more deregulated, but some people were saying the opposite. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, uh, regulates the market for stocks and bonds. Uh, the EPA, or the Environmental Protection Agency you're familiar with, I think already. And Consumer Product Safety Commission is another one. Um, so there gets to be, there was a big trend toward regulation at the end of the 18, coming into the 1890s into the 1910s, 20s, what they call the Progressive Era. It continued on and on into uh, the New Deal Era, uh, into the kind of moderate post-war consensus period. In the 1970s, though, uh, there gets to be a, a reaction against excessive government regulation. Uh, the 70s were kind of a bad economic decade for... America and a lot of the Western world, um, and meanwhile we're seeing the fruits of excessive government regulation and control in the communist world to a great degree, and you start to have a lot more people calling for deregulation of more and more industries, let, letting businesses breathe a little bit more. And of course, the two most famous spokespeople for this uh, phenomenon are Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher over in Great Britain, who uh, she was having to move from a more, in a more dramatic way in some areas, because the British government had become functionally socialistic after World War II, and, you know, she literally, you know, took away government monopolies on numerous uh, industries. So uh, deregulation uh, becomes, it starts in the late 70s, becomes a real trend in the 80s, continues into the 90s, um, uh, and uh, there's disputes, you know, obviously among economists based on their political views and different things about how much the trend toward deregulation has been good and bad. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, to hear the Elizabeth Warrens of the world tell it, you know, deregulation was the root of all evils. Um, obviously, I'm taking a different stance than that. Um, you know, however, there are some areas where people say maybe we've deregulated a couple things here and there that we shouldn't have. There's a lot of fighting over how much regulation and deregulation had to do with the 08 financial crisis. Um, there are some areas where uh, excessive regulation helped cause that stuff, but then there's some areas where some people say, you know, we deregulated too much about the stock market and different things. So, um, but in a lot of areas, deregulation has improved things. Um, there are, uh, you know, a lot of the technology that established the modern cell phone, uh, people had for years, if not even, in fact, even decades before we really had cell phones, uh, but there was, uh, but a lot of the, the technology was unable to pass certain regulations and, and hoops. So there's areas where, uh, you know, 
excessive government regulation slows down innovation. It slows down creativity. Um, uh, so your book gives the case study of airlines. Uh, the airline industry uh, was pretty heavily regulated through 1978. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the rates were largely fixed, and so almost all the competition was uh, in service. That was pretty much the only way that, that this airline was better than another. Um, if you you know if you remember back when there was such thing as uh, airplanes, so uh, so with deregulation there was a couple little problems that you had. Like one was uh, companies now started like you know cutting corners in certain ways. Um, you know one um, airline famously saved millions of dollars a year by eliminating one peanut from their bag, which, you know, is great for the company, is a great business sense, but at the same time, like, you know, man, these bags of peanuts keep getting smaller, right? Uh, you know, you wind up with more crowded uh, airlines because it took a little while, airports, because it took a little while for all of these localities to match kind of the new demand that would come with deregulation. But on balance, deregulation of the airlines was an incredible thing. Uh, did a lot of good. Uh, in fact, the price of air travel decreased significantly as much as, I think the statistic was, was it, uh, 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 yeah, 10 to 18 percent on average, uh, and the sharpest falling uh, in the places on the most traveled route. So, uh, you know, deregulation now, airplanes could change their prices to, you know, to lure people in, and yeah, do they cut some services here there? Yeah, but th for the most part, you know, deregulation worked really well. Uh, for the consumer, and that's a, a pattern that is going to be many times the case. So, uh, anyway, so that's uh, market structures. Uh, we'll come back with another set of videos on the next chapter uh, pretty shortly here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, uh, ha happy quarantine, and uh, hopefully I'll get to see you uh, in a few weeks. Y'all have a good one.